Thank you for inviting me to, to Yale. The very last time I was uh, at the Yale University was uh, when I was interviewed for a postdoc, mm -hmm. and that was precisely 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. I only did two interviews. I interviewed at Johns Hopkins and Yale, and I took the train ride. Then Hopkins offered the first, I just took it, <laughs> the position <laughs> there. And, and the arrow actually points at uh, precisely the arrowhead is precisely where my lab is and I had been there uh, as I mentioned for more than 20 years and uh, I have a little disclosure not all that <laughs> that's important and CME so the objective is really about the role of uh, biomarkers across the spectrum of prostate cancer you know from screening all the way to um, metastatic CRPC. So this is an area that I focus on. So just kind of introduce myself a little bit more, you know, who am I? You know, I, you know, the foremost statement is I'm not a urologist, of course, but when people say, you know, professor of urology, they tend to make mistakes. They often say, you know, what, what's, <laughs> what do you specialize in, et cetera. I actually feel comfortable giving medical advice from time to time, and especially in prostate cancer, because this is an area that I you know, have been working on quite exclusively. I actually try not to touch anything else, although it's kind of really tempting. You know, there are like a bladder cancer surgeons, you know, one that collaborate. You know, it's very interesting projects, but uh, I try to stay within prostate cancer. So it's, uh, it's been that way. And my primary interest is actually uh, in prostate cancer genetics, uh, genomics. I'm interested in cancer biology. I do, you know, those, those cell line experiments in animals, and uh, I am interested. But the main area is actually patient-oriented research uh, concerning biomarkers, and therefore, I spend a lot of time actually organizing the lab to actually to be compatible with patient-oriented research. And it's like half of the activity is always like, you know, how to get into the clinic, consent patients, you know, get the data organized, get the samples organized, preserved over time, how to do longitudinal analysis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is what I, what I do. It's actually kind of a little bit unique. And I look at myself as more like a translational uh, prostate cancer, you know, uh, researcher, and, and how, how do I get to be who I am? I, I think you know a big part of this is really the environment that was set up by you know Patrick Walsh, and he was a chairman for thirty years from nineteen seventy four to two thousand four, I guess. Um, and this picture actually has three of our uh, chairmen here. And Dr. Walsh sitting in front, Dr. Alan Parker, you know, he passed away a few months ago. We had a very nice celebration of his life in uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, Dr. Alaf was the uh, a resident <laughs> in the background, and you probably can recognize him. And he was uh, a resident at the time. And uh, so Dr. Coffee here, he often say, you know, you want to be nice to the trainees because one day they will be your boss. And so here we are. So Dr. Alaf is my boss right now and he was a trainee at the time. And this picture tells a lot of stories and, uh, and the, you know, this, the training that's been done in the department actually regarding um, maybe you know, one third of the chairmen of urology uh, in the country. A lot of the chairmen here, they, Dave Hopkins, he became chairman elsewhere, uh, taking up leadership positions. Mm -hmm. So one thing Dr. Coffey often tell us, well, he had many like uh, famous quotes. And the one quote I really like is, you know, first of all, you want to make sure your data is true, right? But if this is true, what does it mean? And the, to me, uh, mm -hmm. this actually means, you know, in prostate <laughs> cancer, you know, where my data fits in all those unsolved problems in prostate cancer. And we have problem with prostate cancer screening. 
that's very well known, you know, when should we start screening and the PSA, you know, whether it's helpful or not, and should we do targeted screening based on the risk factors, you know, there are genetic, polygenic scores, et cetera. That's what I believe is useful, but it's not in the guideline yet. And, um, you know, what do we do with biopsy? It's really invasive. There are too many of them done in about a million uh, in this country alone. And, um, you know, what do you do with the repeat biopsy? If the first biopsy is negative, what do you do next, right? So all those are really, you know, unsolved problems. There are biomarkers in this area, but uh, not hugely helpful at this time. So certainly when the patient is diagnosed, there is this issue about, you know, whether to go into active surveillance versus definitive treatment, the surgery or radiation. And uh, then, you know, when PSA start to rise following treatment, then this is a time point when, you know, the patient get nervous and doctors get nervous, you know, should we do anything? Okay, so um, there are many potentials in this area right now. And lastly, when the patient become metastatic, you know, by conventional imaging or new imaging modalities, so there are treatments that can be, can be done. Metastatic CRPC, this is the area where most of the pharmaceutical, new pharmaceuticals are developed initially and will continue to be a very important space uh, for uh, drug development and also uh, treatment um, sequencing, et cetera. So, you know, all this area requires, to me, requires uh, some sort of a biomarker to address that. And, and certainly, you know, imaging plays a big role, but um, tr I'll try to focus on uh, biomarkers. So when it comes to biomarkers, you know, I want to briefly divide that into more like in the diagnostic space versus a systemic treatment space and just for simplicity. And within the diagnostic space, you know, we have those, you know, markers involved in the screening, such as PSA and, uh, and its de de derivatives, et cetera. And there are genetic risk factors, not part of it right now, but I think it's more likely to become the reality as time goes on, because there are very strong evidence for that. And the, you know, then there is a you know, pathological you know, diagnosis and the markers like Amica was actually part of the discovery initially about 20 years ago. And those tissue-based markers, they actually sometimes they are helpful, right? So when there is ambiguity in the pathology specimen, you can simply do a very quick staining <laughs> to confirm that. And this is, this is a, you know, kind of use, utilizing pathology as well. And the prognosis, there are a bunch of tissue-based, you know, tests you can do. I don't know if any of you ever ordered that, but you can just order that test. There are multiple companies do those type of things. Uh, and it's tissue-based, you utilize paraffin tissues. And going into the systemic setting, there are two major markers that are utilized. One, you know, what I call, it's more like my terminology. It's probably not familiar to you. Treatment selection versus patient selection. So treatment selection refers to, uh, which drug to give to the patient based on the marker status. So this is more like in the standard of care setting. And so there are very well known examples like uh, BRCA2 mutation, you know, it's actually indicator uh, for uh, PARP inhibitors. And also um, microsatellite instability resulting from mismatch repair defect is an indicator for immunotherapies. But this is a very small proportion of patients who having those uh, indicators. And patient selection is a different concept. It's mainly refers to um, a biomarker test that's actually utilizing clinical trials. So you actually use the biomarker to uh, select the patients to be enrolled into a trial. So this is how I differentiate those. So ARV7 is actually one example, and uh, we discovered ARV7 more than a decade ago, and it's actually being utilized in the patient selection trials. <laughs> so let's go into the, uh, since this is a urology, 
Uh, today, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the diagnostic setting instead, then I'll very quickly go through the uh, uh, systemic setting. And in the diagnostic setting, we know what the problems are. And, you know, mainly, you know, the current diagnostic pathway is biopsy based, right? But we know biopsy, whether it's transparent or transrectal, they are really invasive procedure, you know, patients don't like it. And uh, many unnecessary biopsies as a result of uh, PSA testing. And also, uh, you know, biopsies, they are kind of, you know, they, they give you some uh, prognostic information, but it's not, it's kind of, you know, not great. And, um, and we have MRI, you know, that's a, a routine nowadays. It kind of helps, uh, but MRI, you know, is also invasive and it's uh, uh, expensive as well. So mm -hmm. this sounds like a, a um, you know, a, a big problem. And so how do we approach this? So there are like a urine and the blood, so it's a liquid mm -hmm. and it's, you know, urine yellow and the, and the blood is red. And so certainly liquid biopsies offer many advantages, right? And you know, it, it, it can sample the patient uh, over time and it, it you know, provides a snapshot and it's, it's really easy to do. And to some extent, the urine, I actually consider urine uh, to be easier than blood. And, and so there are already biomarkers in that space actually. So I list the six major ones and then none of them are very widely utilized so i probably won't go through all of them but you can you know we published all this you can uh maybe able to read into that a little bit more but you know one marker that's the very first fda approved test is actually pca it stands for prostate cancer antigen so it's a non-coding rna and uh, you can actually uh, detect it in the in the post di urine and so that was utilized to indicate the, the presence of cancer. It wasn't very good. It was not great. And to make a test great, you actually have to kind of being able to predict in you know, a high grade, high risk disease, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's when the, the uh, select MDS consume is slightly better um, than the PCA test. And the, the ones that are red utilize blood. And so this is um, mainly PSA, isoforms, derivatives, et cetera. And the 4K test this FDA approved, PHI, you're probably familiar with that. And they are slightly better than PSA alone. So I wouldn't go through the detail, but just to make the point that, uh, you know, this is not my work. People have been working on it and it's available, commercialized. So where do we come in? So the one urologist I worked very extensively is Christian Pavlovich. So he had been thinking about this question about, you know, how do you actually detect, you know, exfoliated prostate cancer cells in urine post DIE? And uh, so the, the question had been worked on uh, a little bit. So when I thought about this, talked to him about this, you know, it's mainly about the question about where do those cells coming from? So we thought that if you can see cells in urine post DIE, it's probably because it's, you know, you're probably seeing a subtype that's either intraductal disease, which is nasty, we all know, can be ductal carcinoma, and those are, you know, pathology terms. And it can also be invasive SNI invading through the duct ductal system. So those are probably the cells you're detecting. And if you, indeed you can detect it, it's actually helpful, right? Because you are detecting using non-invasive, you know, approach to get the cellular material. So that's when we thought about, you know, the approach that's uh, very different. Seeing is believing. So all the six tests I showed to you, you actually don't see the cells, you know, they all use some sort of a test, you know, PCR base, we call that grind and the bind, and you don't see anything, and they, what you get is a number. But we want to be able to see the cell. Seeing the cells has, you can involve like a two different approach. One is protein-based, 
and the protein base actually Christian worked on it a little bit and it wasn't great protein you know the IHC is kind of dirty and there's a limited selection so we thought about using RNA so RNA has an advantage so I had a lot of experience when uh, working on ARV7 we adopted you know very early version of the, the the base scope assay, and it's very specific. The signal noise ratio is really good. And you can also select, you know, different regions of RNA, and also non-coding RNAs can be utilized for detection as well. And you can easily multiplex, et cetera. So there's a lot of advantage. So we just kind of went ahead and we, you know, I had the extra money through the, you know, the nice Frank Human endowment in around 2017. And uh, so the money actually was utilized to, to hire a postdoc, Joe Eskra. And she's really meticulous in terms of uh, setting up the whole system. Every step of the way, she has to like optimize the workflow, starting from sample processing and the storage, and the spin them down, spin the pallet down on the slide, making a pathology slide. Then the most difficult part is actually the image analysis, and we have like a you know a quarter million uh, dollar microscope system to look at you know all the cells because it's a very complex uh, cellular environment. There's a lot of junk in there, and you want to find you know a needle in the haystack. It's not easy, but she was able to set up the system, and you know, it was very convincing. And the whole protocol, the entire protocol, is published. You know this. No, we didn't withhold any details. It's in, in the website. So like I said, you can work on multiple uh, probes. So we tested a bunch of probes. And uh, so you actually kind of need to have the knowledge about prostate cancer biology biomarkers to make the selections. So we did a bunch of, of them. And so the ones worked out the best in terms of uh, mainly based on signal noise ratio and also based on the ability of uh, differentiating cells of prosthetic origin versus other cells, as well as the differentiation of cancer cells, prostate cancer cells versus uh, just prostate cells. We select the three markers. So one is PRAC1 and the other is NKX. PRAC1 is also non-coding by the way. And the prostate cancer antigen three actually surprisingly remains the best marker to differentiate um, prostate cancer cell versus the normal prostate cells. So, you know, we got criticized a lot, uh, but we just pick what works. And we don't care if it's an old marker and it's, it's really old. PCA3 actually was discovered at Brady by, you know, Bill Isaacs, you know, about 30 years ago. And, but it remains to be really good. So we just pick whatever that works. We don't care whether it's novel or whatever. Yeah, so we got criticized for lack of novelty. But nevertheless, you know, we started a, a small cohort of study. So those are like three examples of a patient sample. The first one is actually negative. And the, we have a nice signal of uh, exfoliated cells from the prostate indicated by NKX and the PRAC1, but there's only one dot for PCA3. So one dot based on experience is not real. Typically it's because of the you know, staining of the DNA, one dot or two dot, we actually discard that. Yeah. So, but the second example actually has multiple dots and we call that positive. And interestingly, most of the, cell, most of the cases, they actually have cells clumped together. So this is, Really nice. This, this is the kind of observation you cannot get with this grind and bind approach that six tests that you see. So this is a seeing of believing. This is actually what I call as the, the harvest of the deep dive. And you get those you know, really beautiful prostate cancer cells from a non-invasive sample, you know, from more like as a urology setting. So, um, yeah, so we did a small study with Christian in the 90s. This is published in Journal of Urology not too long ago. So the take home is no matter how you dichotomize, you know, the, the patients, whether it's like a cancer versus no cancer, you know, a 
uh, high grade, high risk, using different criteria, you know, the Epstein criteria, et cetera. The specificity is above 90%. You know, we actually believe it's <laughs> got to be 100%. And it, it's not 100% because biopsy itself is utilized as a golden standard and the biopsy itself is not perfect, right? And so because we see the cells, so that there's got to be prostate cancer. So it's you actually considered to be more like a definitive diagnosis. So, so it's very provocative, but we actually think about, you know, this is a group of patients. Now you can kind of forego the entire biopsy pathway and just go straight to uh, treatment setting. So this is something we have been thinking about, but it's very provocative. We need more data. We need to do definitely need to do more. And, and so just kind of summarize this portion of the work that had more to do with the urology. So we have, you know, the technical capability. We have a, like a full protocol that, uh, you know, an experienced lab person can replicate. And certainly, you know, clinically, we need to do, do more. And uh, I think, you know, as long as a patient has a, a prostate, this test can be applied. It can be pre-radiation therapy. It can be in the active surveillance setting. It can even be like a right before surgery. So this is a, like a very precisely designed study that I am very interested in. We are trying to get funding to, to do that. And so, like I said, it was very much criticized for lack of novelty because of the markers they're kind of, you know, really old. But, you know, what I believe in is, you know, you, you can kind of inject a lot of novelty in there because you actually get a non-invasive sample that give you cellular material that you can do genomics on. So it's not mature yet, but there are novel cutting edge technologies coming out that will allow you to pick individual cells from a cytology slide mm -hmm. to do single cell based analysis. And so this is gonna be in a, a sampling strategy, allowing you to do genomic analysis. So you don't actually don't have to do those invasive procedure to get the sample. But the drawback of course is it still requires DRE, right? So we're trying to overcome that as well. And, uh, you know, we are thinking about, we haven't done anything, but we are talking to, you know, Dan Sayakvich, who's a robot person, you know, we're thinking about a medical device that can uh, kind of mimic the DIE process. So this is kind of, you know, at, still at a discussion stage. So I am uh, personally interested in the, the question of prostate cancer disparity. I actually worked on that a lot when I was younger <laughs> and I never published anything because uh, the data was, you know, very difficult to interpret. So, but I also look at this as a, as a sampling strategy to get a lot of samples and uh, very quickly because urine is really quick and uh, you can collect the urine uh, kind of easily uh, provided we can get the device to work. Okay, so that's the, uh, the harvest of the deep dive. So I want to thank all the people. And the Daniel is actually, he's a remarkable story. He offered himself about five years ago as a volunteer. Now he, he, he worked, he's still with us. He left, then he came back and he's working with me as a volunteer right now. And the Julia, she just went to medical school and she stayed with us for three years. And uh, her job is to go into the clinic to collect samples with uh, uh, Christian. And uh, Ken Pienta is our research director. We have a nice setup of our repository flow. And this picture here, I want to show that. You've probably seen that before. So this is a centennial celebration in the hotel where the very first dinner in 1915 was, was held. And uh, so Dr. Parting was, was a host at the time. So let's kind of quickly go to the systemic treatment setting. And I want to give, you know, the examples of uh, systemic treatment. So, you know, we all know as a urology person, you know, we, when we talk about systemic treatment, we must mention hormonal manipulation. So this is, uh, you know, the one therapy that got, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
like the Charles Huggins Nobel Prize. So this picture actually had the uh, uh, William Scott, who was our second chairman for 30 years uh, in the picture. So, quote, you know, 1,000 years from now, the therapy will continue to be utilized. So there's a lot of uh, credit to that statement. And can kind of tell that after you treat the patient with uh, those conventional antigen deprivation therapy, you know, the AR actually continue to be active. So this is a very well established and they continue to be active mainly because of the AR gene itself undergo many alterations, including the gene level uh, changes, you know, can be structural change, it's an enhancer and, uh, and also the gene body uh, can, can be amplified and uh, sometimes it leads to AR overexpression. AI overexpression can also occur without structural changes. Certainly, we are the ones who uh, have been really interested in ARV7. And there are also point mutations that can make you know, those uh, traditional antagonists uh, as agonists. Uh, and so this kind of tells you that prostate cancer is kind of addicted to AR and they don't break out of the AR loop very easily, although they do nowadays because of the you know, very heavy treatment with the newer versions of the uh, uh, hormonal agents. So this is another example. So even this is a paper published in Nature a uh, very short while ago. And what this is showing is the shaded uh, region is uh, the first one is an AR uh, androgen receptor enhancer. And uh, the second shaded area is an androgen receptor gene body. And uh, both of them, they have elevated copy number uh, by five to tenfold before. And when you compare the before and after epiradron and the lutamide treatment sa uh, samples, so this is a strictly liquid sample, and you just kind of take the uh, blood sample, make plasma DNA out of that, and you can do assays like this to look into the androgen receptor uh, copy number alteration. So what this tells you is, even if the very, you know, after very potent suppression of AR, AR keeps going up. So this, another example that androgen, you know, prostate cancer is addicted to androgen receptor. But, you know, we also worry about prostate cancer progression into AR in different setting, right? So this is where uh, a lot of interest uh, is right now. But I believe AR still plays <laughs> a very significant role and uh, because of this data. So it kind of explains why the treatment landscape is uh, kind of dominated by the red uh, drugs right now. It's very complicated uh, picture nowadays. And the doctors, you know, even the doctors have problems about which drug to pick. And so there are a lot of trials going on and they're using, you know, double A, triple A therapies. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't go into details into that. And everybody tried to, you know, push the drug into the early stage setting because there are more patients to, to treat. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't be surprised if over time you find all those new drugs in the PSA rising formation, uh, I mean, setting. And that's already, there are many trials going on. And even in the uh, earlier setting, and it could be like, you know, active surveillance setting, you could, you know, new adjuvant setting, etc. So all this uh, are happening. So hormonal aging, they are, you know, my, my view is the line between oncology, medical oncology and urology are actually kind of blurring right now. And uh, so this is something we, uh, you know, as a prostate cancer people, we need to pay attention to. And, um, and the lutetium PSMA is a very nice uh, therapy. And likewise, it's probably gonna go to the earliest stage setting. Yeah, so as I said, you know, it's nice to have so many therapies, but there are problems. And the problem really is, you know, how do you pick? You, you are facing with too many options, right? 
so you know it, it's it's kind of really difficult to to um, to make a you know different different determination. So this is where biomarkers can be helpful. And in the uh, treatment setting, I mean in the clinical trial setting, you know pharmaceutical companies they are struggling as well, and uh, the it's very challenging to find a disease setting that you know will allow you to enroll patients. So this is when treatment selection and patient selection markers it will be helpful. So there are already, I probably mentioned this already, so there are already like uh, markers that's being utilized. And, uh, but you know, the two well-known markers, they are actually not really limited to prostate cancer. They apply to other cancers as well. So uh, young damage repair and also mismatch repair defect, you know, indicated for pop inhibition and uh, uh, PD-1, pd one uh, inhibitors. And they only cover a very small portion of the patients. And the CTC markers, you know, ARV7, we have worked on that quite extensively. And uh, we have published like maybe I didn't even count, maybe 40 papers so, so far. And so I'll just kind of summarize a timeline just to kind of showcase, you know, developing a biomarker is almost like developing a drug, you know, it takes a very long time. And so Dr. Hu, you know, is, uh, he, she was the one who cloned ARV7 in the early years and she's a social professor of pathology that was counseling right now. And um, I was, Fortunately, to find Emmanuel Antonio Rackers, we worked really well together. And, uh, you know, we, we published in the New England Journal, JCO, European Urology, JMA, et cetera, and all those major medical journals uh, about the ARV7 story. And shortly after that uh, clinical study, the test was uh, uh, put in the clear lab at Hopkins uh, and offered to patients, and that was done in collaboration between uh, Dr. Eshelman who directs the molecular diagnostic lab. So we worked uh, together and we just kind of went to the uh, a, uh, advisory board meeting. We get $10,000, uh, $100,000 from a donor. So that's how we get this test implemented in the, in the clinic. So it's a, it's a hospital offered uh, uh, test. And then, you know, people still want to do like a validation behind the study, and that's led by Dr. Armstrong at Duke. And uh, it's, it was supposed to be a two year study, but it, it took like four years to publish. And so that was published as well. And so the, the one thing that's kind of relatively uh, unknown, you know, also there is an antibody based test. And uh, so we didn't make direct contribution, but they looked at data. So that's the basis for their, for a lot of the, uh, the rationale and also study, et cetera. And so, so the one thing that I want to mention is it's actually utilized in a uh, FDA breakthrough trial, phase three trial. Uh, you know, it's a drug called the Galeron. And um, unfortunately, you know, so, so this trial actually select patients with ARV7 positive disease. Unfortunately, the patient population had very progressive disease. You know, you actually don't have had time to assess the endpoint. So because of the very high um, attrition rate, you know, the, the trial was stopped early and uh, the drug didn't succeed. As a result, the biomark didn't succeed either. So as a companion diagnostic test, you have to have the, the drug to succeed for the biomarker to be approved. Mm -hmm. So this is a, the case for BRCA2 and all those DNA damage uh, response genes. And so what's next? So you know, this is a very nice editorial written by uh, Dr. Uh, Kanayama, um, who is uh, actually a virologist from Japan. She wanted to do research. And so there are a lot of options with respect to like getting the blood sample and uh, getting the different uh, tests done. But I believe that, uh, you know, you have to be very careful and every test has to be analytically validated before you can actually, uh, you know, do clinical study. And uh, this is getting relatively mature nowadays. And, um, and we are doing quite a bit of that right now because of the sample collection that's being accumulated over the years. So you can store the plasma 
in minus 80 indefinitely almost. And so you can take them out and do all those studies. And this is a patient that actually has a deletion phenotype. And uh, we have many of those profiles right now where you can actually take the plasma DNA and uh, you know, do the whole genome analysis. And so that's gonna give you a lot of data. Whole genome sequencing is getting cheaper, but the main bottleneck, you know, we severely un underestimated in the beginning was the need for bioinformatician. So this is a, you know, th th this is the, the bottleneck right now. So I have Daniel working like a remotely right now, but I think, you know, it's, it's not enough. So just kind of, you know, just point to some directions about the future, you know, what, you know, are we going to focus on, you know, following in the post arv 7 you know, V7 is nice, but like I said, when those drugs move to early stage setting, you don't have CTC to work with. So this is a CTC based test. So it's not going to be useful anymore. So we certainly want to get into the, you know, the all in approach to liquid biopsy, try to do everything. And the urine, we need to continue to do that. And we want to embed our uh, assay into prospective trials. That's called uh, uh, integrated trials. And also there's another category of trial is called the integral, where a biomarker is actually the requirement for, uh, for the trial. And so certainly we talk about precision a lot, right? Precision surgery, et cetera, but precision measurement is a key to biomarker uh, discovery and implementation. So we want to make use of those very novel uh, cutting edge technologies. And certainly we are doing a lot in the lab and we have a nanopore machine and doing the long read sequencing. And uh, you know, we have all sorts of things going on. Uh, right now. So we are not the developers of those tools. You know, we want, we want to utilize those tools that are coming out for uh, biomarker research. And uh, so therefore, you know, it's very important for us to get the patient resources, get the data organized, you know, get the samples organized, et cetera. So that's going to drive what I think is going to drive uh, discovery. So like I said, I'm also interested in disparity. So there are very interesting HOXP-13 mutations that are coming up. There are some mutations coming out of West Africa about 3,000 years ago. It's a founder mutation that we are very interested in, and we are working on that. So with mutation, uh, especially germline mutation, it's kind of nice that um, you can actually, you know, actually you know, even if it's low frequency, you can actually use that to uh, facilitate adoption of genetic testing, which you know, actually provides a positive feedback for early diagnosis, uh, early detection, et cetera. Yeah. So this is probably, uh, this. I think this is the last slide in you know, the V7 work. Actually started out uh, at the Christmas party and I talked to Mario Eisenberg, Mike Caducci and uh, and they got very interested in, they said, uh, we have to find you a fellow. And uh, Emmanuel was a fellow at the time. Dude. And so that's how we got connected. And the Dr. Who you know, made a major com contribution by you know, characterization. And so this one thing that's really important is, you know, I had to recruit people to run the clinic. And the first uh, person I recruited was, uh, uh, Kanayama, so we call her uh, Dr. Nakazawa right now. So she is like 10 years apart. She started as a technician, now she's a, a clinical fellow and she's gonna do really well in the future. She was succeeded by uh, Silver Stein. He's also a doctor right now, he went to Stanford. And uh, so this is my lab picture uh, right here. So this is like a first post-pandemic lab picture. We are, it's farewell for a Japanese fellow it's going back to Japan. <laughs> and the middle picture is of people I, most of people I collaborated with for ARV7. And so this is actually an ARV7 meeting. So it's dedicated to ARV7 before, right before the AUA meeting. And it's got, you know, all the 
a major who's who in the AR and uh, and uh, Charles Sawyer, as you Hunter Bono, and uh, and the Prostate Cancer Foundation folks in the the industry, uh, etc. Yeah. So this this is all I I'll present today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, I have a question, <laughs> and uh, so the ARV7 uh, is a liquid biomarker. I know it's been done on the uh, cancer-resistant metastatic setting. Mm -hmm. Any explorations in terms of uh, using that to, to, to differentiate between a high-risk versus a uh, low-risk, let's say, in a localized setting? Yeah, so there are quite a few studies, and now it's hugely convincing, I think. And part of it you know, may have to do with, uh, you know, the assay itself actually yeah so there are studies done in the radical um, prostatectomy setting just using the radical samples but that's already like after surgery right so there was a european urology article about uh, in that setting and those patients tend to be progressed uh, very fast they tend to you know if they go on androgen deprivation therapy they tend to do worse yeah, so there are studies like that. Um, I myself didn't do a lot. Yeah, but whether it's um, suitable for like a, either biopsy based or you know tissue based testing, I'm actually not quite sure. I didn't pursue um, those study very aggressively, mainly because you know the uh, detection is very challenging because the, the expression level is kind of low. Yeah. So in the localized setting, uh, if you ask me to do it, I would <laughs> say uh, no. no. Yeah. Okay. But in the last few years, it was uh, some big particle study that came out. I can't remember. It was one of the Nature journals or JAMA journals about uh, tissue markers with like uh, luminal and basal. That's the opposite of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And it seems so promising that I haven't heard much from it. What What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so you know, this kind of you know really fascinating biology uh, behind that. So there, you know, this is more like you know using the uh, profiles that are indicating whether it's a luminal type or a, a basal type. Yeah, so I, I think you know in comparison to breast cancer. The signal is actually, you know, not quite there, you know, in terms of a, for like a, you know, clinical use. So that's just more like a, my personal opinion uh, from this. So for breast cancer is actually, you know, much better than, uh, than uh, prostate cancer. We look at prostate cancer as more like a, a uh, you know, luminal type of uh, uh, disease in, in general. And, uh, you know, even the, um, the cells that, uh, that are regenerated following uh, castration, we believe they are luminal origin uh, mainly. So there's more evidence for the luminal origin than the, uh, you know, either the intermediate phenotype or the basal phenotype. Yeah, so for strictly for clinical use, I, I don't think it's, it's there. Yeah, my personal opinion on it. Dr. Lu. Joseph, you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Dr. Lu, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. This was very enlightening. This is, um, um, thank, uh, thank you for your time here. So um, just a quick question. One of the, you know, questions that we face um, as a medical oncologist in treating patients with a newly diagnosed MCSPC, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the intensification and also de-intensification of systemic therapy for MCSPC, as you know, we triple therapy versus tablets. Um, we, we only use clinical parameters. We count the you know, number of lesions, right? As opposed to other disease groups, they look at genomic biomarkers or they look at different, um, you know, more novel, bi sophisticated biomarkers, but we use clinical parameters. Any insights you can share with us in terms of, you know, biomarker development in, in newly diagnosed MCSPC? Yeah, so in newly diagnosed, uh, HSPC, you know, I actually believe uh, intensification is probably a good approach, although, you know, it takes time, takes years to, 
you know, to, to get the outcome, right? So you also need to run like a randomized trials in order to get definitive evidence. But, you know, we kind of believe in, uh, in intensification, especially because the aging, the, uh, the, they have a tolerable uh, efficacy. But in terms of a biomarker, this is a space that's really, uh, it's a fertile uh, space to get into, uh, I believe. And, um, you know, the, uh, the liquid biopsies is, uh, you know, the all-in approach that I described is probably the, the way to go. But, you know, if the patient has, uh, you know, diagnostic specimens, although there might be a you know, time difference, you can utilize that as well. So, you know, this is, this, uh, I believe this is a very nice space to, to get into. And, uh, you know, if I am a treating uh, physician, I would like to do everything I can uh, to, you know, to get into the molecular profile. You want to do liquid, you want to do tissue, you want to get into the germline, you want to get into the somatic status uh, as well. Yeah. So, but as you said, the clinical information is very important as well. You know, the tumor burden, et cetera, there's very good evidence to suggest the, uh, the efficacy of a uh, docetaxel in, in the high volume disease, et cetera. So docetaxel is gonna be, you know, a, a big part of this. And um, yeah, I hope that addresses your question. Thank you for your question. Um, given the specificity of the first diagnostic test you were talking about with the liquid biomarker, um, is it at the point where like you don't need to do any other testing for that? Like once it's negative, it's always negative or would it be something? Because I assume if somebody's getting that, they maybe have an elevated PSA already. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't think, I know maybe it hasn't been tested in that fashion, but I mean, with the specificity that high, mm -hmm. it could, you could be done, right? Yeah, so that's precisely what we thought about. And, and I even asked like, um, you know, some really smart people in the area as well. So they were all pointing into this direction. It's like, you can probably forego everything, but it, it, the thing is, it only benefit the patient with a positive diagnosis. And presumably the MRI, you know, MRI didn't pick that up, but your test picked that up. And so then this, this is when the patient can actually benefit, right? So they don't have to undergo any other unnecessary testing. It just goes straight to treatment. And so the thing is, the sensitivity is low. So it does not have, it's not designed to be, to have like a high negative predictive value, like, you know, all the other tests are designed to do. So you cannot rule out. You can, you can only rule in. You cannot rule out. So that's it. But we still believe it's helpful, and uh, and the ruling things um, to completely rule out is actually really difficult as well. And yeah, do you uh, do you believe that when if you take a certain set of markers like PC three or or different things that you've talked about, many have talked about, mm -hmm. that ultimately there's some signal there that looks interesting but it'll never pan out because of so much heterogeneity and that that ai is what's going to be needed to take millions and millions and millions of points of data and correlate all these different markers all these different genes and then come up with something that's more uh, uh, validated and reproducible yeah so I, I'm glad you mentioned AI. You know, I think it's it's going to be a very big part of the the future, and you know, even for like a prognosis, etc. So you want to like put every possible piece of data together to train, you know, the, the algorithm. And um, you know, heterogeneity is always a big, very big issue. But that's precisely why we went for liquid biopsy and because liquid is systemic, right? So as opposed to, you know, just biopsy, you know, it entirely depends on where you hit. Um, and, uh, you know, all this, you know, other information that can be potentially helpful. 
And uh, you know, AI is something I truly believe in. And so even it's, it's everywhere. So even when we do the like a germline mutation calling, right? So we call whether this is a mutation or not. So we tried like a, there are a lot of tools out there, you know, uh, GATK, VAR scan, you know, free buys. Then we try the AI approach it's called a deep variant. And everything's deep, <laughs> it's a deep dive. And, and it's better. It's better than all the other tools. Yeah. So, but, but I think, you know, the, the thing that we need to pay attention to is really the, the accuracy of the data collection and uh, the very careful process that, uh, you know, you, you collect all the, you know, measurements and uh, whether it's uh, lab based measurements or, you know, even collecting data from the, uh, the you know, electronic medical records, et cetera. So those are, those are the things that are, you know, we need to be very careful about just to make sure, need to make sure the data are collected very carefully, authentically, and yeah. What are your thoughts on the ARV7 as a therapeutic target? Yeah, so it remains very, a uh, very hot area. So, you know, the thing that I keep telling people is, you know, you, you have to consider the advantage of the, the test itself. So you have a test in there that can very quickly identify patients. You can non-invasively even evaluate the, the outcome potentially. And so there are a lot of efforts in there and the majority of them, they are indirect targeting you know, they develop an aging, then they evaluate where they hit both AR and ARV7. And there are a number of them there. Uh, yeah, so the only one that's kind of direct, you know, was uh, by SR Pharmaceuticals. So they are trying to target the end terminal domain, which obviously will hit both. So this is on purpose. And the first one kind of failed, but they have a new one that's undergoing phase two trial right now. And, um, and, uh, you know, uh, I know you are interested in this area and we can discuss more about it. Protax, certainly, you know, there are uh, the ones that are kind of advanced uh, that's leading, they actually target <laughs> the combining domain. And uh, so there's a very good reason for that. So I'm not sure, you know, when it hits ARV7, it's because of the heterodimer formation. So I kind of doubt that a little bit. And because our lab data does not support the importance of uh, heterodimer. And uh, so this is also unpublished, but there are contradictory data in the literature right now. Yeah, so there are, you know, even the lutetium PSMA. <laughs> so there is very good data out there that, you know, V7 positive patients they actually respond really well. So there are like a standard of care approach that can work as well. So we do have some limited evidence for uh, docetaxel. So B7 positive patients actually, they are more likely to benefit uh, uh, from docetaxel treatment. Yeah, in comparison to the, uh, to abiraterone with a little more. All right, thank you. <clears throat>